Outrocast. Uh, you ready, Alan? Yes, sir. I'm ready. Okay, Alan, thank you for taking the time to speak with me. And it's such an honor and a pleasure because you have a wonderful, wonderful book. And let me say the full name of that book. It is Southern Man, Music and Mayhem in the American South. How long did it take you to write that book? Actually, uh, uh, about three years after I sat down and literally got into it, you know, I had started several others that uh, I, I uh, uh, discarded. and uh, But this one, uh, about, about three years. Wow. What was it about the other ones that made you discard them? You didn't think I just uh, I didn't think that I wrote them very well. I just uh, I, I just thought I could do better, you know. Hmm. What's your process like as an author? Because I am speaking to a music business legend, but you had decades of telling artists mm, that's not good enough. You could be better. So you saw everybody else's creative process. What's yours? Wait a minute, I didn't get to leave. He asked, what is your creative process as an author, like doing your videos and... Well, it just gave me a chance to tell uh, my story. I've always had been the guy in the background, uh, yeah. letting my brothers be out front. And uh, uh, so it was, it was uh, good for me to be able to finally come out and tell my side and my views of what was good and what was bad. And it, it gave me a, a great release uh, just to know that I had finally said uh, what my story was, you know? Yeah. Uh, when you started in the music industry, very few managers were kind of public figures. There was Colonel Parker, there was Barry Gordy, but usually we didn't know the people behind the curtain. Were you afraid with this book to kind of come out publicly like that? No, I was actually glad that uh, it was happening. I mean, I was very proud of the work that I had done. And, and uh, it was finally a chance of me being recognized for doing a lot of things that other people had received credit for, you know. And uh, I knew in my heart, wait a minute, I did that. <laughs> you know, it was, it was my work that, that brought that part of uh, history, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it felt real good to me. I mean, it was it was uh, uh, just for my moral, my spirits. Uh, it just made me feel real extra good, you know. Yeah. Well, one of your famous companies, Hustlers Inc. I don't think anybody used the term hustler before you. Do you predate? You know, not just Larry Flint, but hip hop using the term hustler all the time. Yeah, well, see, I named my company Hustlers before there was a magazine. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, what, what Hustlers meant was hard worker in the field term, uh, use the words, uh, let's hustle, you know. And uh, so that I named it that, and then the magazine came out and kind of <laughs> gave it a slanted uh, <laughs> interpretation of what Hustler may have meant, you know. It was before Hustler meant uh, a prostitute or, or any of the uh, dirty stuff, you know? Yeah. So going back, you spent three years about writing the book. So what's your process like? Were you talking into a recorder and transcribing it or writing by hand? Well, a lot of it I, I uh, videotaped. Uh, me talking and uh, that was my easiest way of putting it down and uh, some of it you know I, like late night I would write you know, while I was in bed you know so a lot of it was just written from my thoughts you know. Hmm. Did you have a hard time remembering a lot of stuff did you need visual aids or to talk to people or did you just have it all up here? I mine pretty well came from all of there, <laughs> you know. It, uh, I down on uh, Broadway, which was where my office was. They called me Long Wind because I could talk some, tell so many diff different stories, and 
I do. I had a lot of exciting stories in my life, and they were very entertaining. Uh, even with the book out there, I've been asked now to do a, a speaking book where I would actually uh, tell the stories myself. Uh, a lot of times that I put a lot of emphasis into it that doesn't make it on pages, you know. And uh, But it was a thrill for me to write it. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, you know. One of the areas where you had a lot of success was in publishing. Most people don't know what publishing is. How did you get to understand publishing? It's very complex. Well, uh, you know, in, in our days, uh, artists and, and managers did not publish a lot of books or uh, songs, you know? So it was, uh, I was one of the pioneers that came in and, and uh, actually uh, got it down on paper and, and uh, people liked it, you know, and when I write uh, different stories, they always, always had plenty of comments on it. And uh, it did me good to make me feel good to know that the uh, audience itself was getting it firsthand from me. And uh, uh, it really made me uh, feel special with them. I started learning the publishing business when Otis Redding re-signed with uh, uh, Vote Records. Uh, you know, my brother actually came up with the uh, asking for part of the publishing. At that point, I didn't even know what publishing was, uh, you know, and, and uh, he came back from uh, Memphis and told me, so, well, we got this and we got that. And then we, and we got part of the publishing. And I was like, what the hell is the publisher? What, <laughs> what, do, we, what do we get? Why didn't you get cash? <laughs> you know? Well, you published the Leonard Skinner catalog. So Freebird and Sweet Home Alabama. Was that the first catalog that really took off for you or was it Otis Redding's? Well, I learned it with Otis Redding. I mean, I, I, you know, we, we published uh, uh, Doc of the Bay and Respect, and I've been loving you too long. And there were a lot of hits with Otis. That's when we realized how valuable publishing could be because we started receiving these very nice-sized checks. Yeah. But uh, by the time I opened Hustlers, it was Leonard Skinner was my first uh, group that, uh, I published all their songs, uh, uh, every, every one on the first two albums. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, then there was Sweet Home Alabama, which did pretty good for me. And, yeah. and Freebird still lives on today, you know, and yeah. uh, Give Me Three Steps. And I had an awful lot of good songs in my catalog, you know. It, and, if if I've done my research correctly, you retired in 1999, but all these artists you worked with, the music still matters 20 plus years later. Right. Well, I tell you, you know, we, we, we uh, kind of picked the groups that we thought would go on for a long time, you know, and uh, Leonard Skinner was, what was so funny was Leonard Skinner was probably the most misspelled, mispronounced band in history. <laughs> we won worst album cover of the year for two straight years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, all we cared about was what the music was inside that sleeve, you know. And uh, uh, I never uh, cared much about what the album cover was as, as long as we knew we had the guts in the middle, you know. The but, guts uh, in the middle. These guys were, you know, guys that rehearsed. Uh, they went to uh, rehearsals like ordinary people go to their jobs. I mean, it was, you know, it was five days a week from nine o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the afternoon. And, and, uh, they were probably the, the most rehearsed band that was out there on the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they even played their solos identical. <laughs> I mean, they were, they were note for note. Uh, and and uh, they were just a super talent, you know. And uh, when I heard Freebird, you can imagine my feelings, I was like, wow, man, that song there is getting it, you know, that's getting it good. 
And uh, all of the songs, uh, I, I sat down with them in the beginning. I said, now, don't be writing songs about living in London and Paris and drinking uh, champagne and eating caviar. I said, talk about being in the damn swamps and talk about drinking whiskey and beer and, and uh, talk about what you are in real life, write about what you are, you know, and, and uh, they handled that real well. And uh, Ronnie was the uh, second most prolific writer I had. Otis Redding was the, the most prolific, but uh, Ronnie Van Zandt was the second. You could give him, I could give him an idea for a song in the morning and by that evening, he'd call me up and play me a, a finished song, you know? Wow. And, uh, he uh, he was just super talented. Yeah. Plus, he was a, one hell of a band leader. Uh, Ronnie ruled Leonard Skinner with an iron hand. Uh, if if they messed up too much, they got a good woman. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, they were fighting band. If they weren't fighting with somebody out in the public, they they'd be fighting among themselves. You know. Wow. I knew of one incident where Ronnie backed himself up in the corner and says, I'm going to whip every one of his ass all at once, one at a time. And uh, they all jumped him at once, and he still whipped them all. <laughs> uh, he had the fastest hands of uh, anybody besides Ali. And uh, uh, he was not a real tall guy, but... But he'd jump up in the air and hit down on you, you know. And <laughs> he, when he hit you, he he uh, you knew you got hit good. Uh, his knuckles were actually in ditches where he had been in so many fights. They were <laughs> he had fight street fighters knuckles, you know. Did he write music on the piano, or did he just hear the songs in his head? He let the. Uh, uh, he didn't use a piano or guitar. He uh, uh, always had someone with him to play those, you know. He he uh, he just stood there and sp uh, spit out the words, you know. And uh, uh, all of them fit, fell right in a row. I mean, Ronnie's word was the law. I mean, it, it was... Uh, and he was their inspiration too. Uh, some of them had not written before they met him, and and uh, he inspired them to write. Hmm. And we, we had the whole band practically wrote. Uh, uh, in fact, they all did write something in somewhere in the songs, you know. But uh, it was interesting to uh, watch them write. You know, uh, I went down to Jacksonville for uh, a rehearsal, we were getting ready to play with the Who, the first American uh, Who tour in years. Mm -hmm. Super important. Uh, everybody in the world wanted that Who tour. And uh, uh, my booking agent, Alex Hodges, and I uh, did a super job of securing that Who tour. We had... Well, we knew Pete Rudge was flying from uh, Atlanta to New York, and uh, I planted one guy on one side of him, and I planted another one on the other side of him. And Ron Delson was one of them from New York. And oh yeah, I remember Ron Delson. He's still Ron, around. Ron Delson told Pete, "Oh, I played a man. They are incredible." He he had not played them at all. He had never even heard of. Them. But he did it as a favor to me, you know. And uh, the other one was Tony Rafino, who had played them in Birmingham, and he went on about them. But uh, they pounded him all the way to uh, New York. By the time he landed in New York, Leonard Skinner had, had the Who tour, and man, that was that was the boost that they needed. That actually was what broke the band wide open. Uh, we had sold a lot of records in Atlanta because we had a following in Atlanta since that was the one city we played a lot. Mm -hmm. But then the Who tour broke us nationally. I mean, we were, we were, there was a situation where police had to 
uh, beat the fans off the stage with billy clubs to get them to get off the damn stage. And uh, uh, Freebird excited the masculine side of a guy. And uh, we could count on there'd be several fights break out after uh, Freebird out in the audience, you know. And, and uh, yeah. Uh, they they just had a tough they had a tough following and uh, they they lived up to it you know it, these it, guys drank these guys drank like we drink Coca Colas you know <laughs> yeah they uh, uh, I bought a fifth of whiskey to take down to rehearsal with me one time and uh, <laughs> cracked that bottle open and. Said, well, you got some ginger ale, uh, Coca Cola, or something. She said, well, no, man, we don't need that. Chug a little bit right out of the bottle. That bottle of fifth of uh, whiskey was gone in a matter of minutes, and they had already sent out and got two more. <laughs> they they <laughs> say that, I'm sorry to interrupt you. They say that Leonard Skinner was the first band to open for The Who where they didn't get booed off the stage. Yeah, they, uh, they, they, you know, we we said when we went into rehearsal, I said, uh, do not have more than a three second pause between songs. Don't give them a chance to clap you or to boo you, because most acts would get booed off if they were the opening act for the uh, the who, you know. I mean, they they boo you right off stage. Well, we didn't give them a chance. As soon as one song slammed down, another one kicked off, you know, and and uh, we always got a, a tremendous uh, response from the audience because it was all tight as a tick, you know, and uh, that was a real experience, as a learning experience. Bear in mind, they had been playing bars that held maybe 800, maybe as many as 1,000 people, and all of a sudden, the out that smallest audience is 18,000 people, you know. And uh, so they, uh, by the time they finished that tour, they, they were a headliner in their own right. Uh, they could go out and, and, and headline packages themselves. But uh, they were uh, a, a true Southern spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, they they uh, loved each other. And they uh, defended each other. If one got in a fight, the whole band fought with them, you know. And most of the time, Ronnie finished it for them. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he, uh, I saw him one time. There was a guy that must have weighed 300, maybe 325. Big, huge guy. And uh, uh, Ronnie, uh, uh, had I given him a bottle of Chevis Regal Scotch because of the, it was the Who Tour, mm -hmm. and I'd bought him that bottle of Scotch. Well, this guy was a bouncer in the club. He saw Ronnie walking around with that bottle of whiskey in his hand. He just walked up and snatched that bottle of whiskey out of Ronnie's hand and uh, uh, went walking back by the bar. And Ronnie turned him around and says, Hey, man. You ain't nothing but big, that's all. Says, I'm gonna rip your dick off and I'm gonna stuff it down your throat. <laughs> Give me my damn whiskey and snatch it back out of his hand. But that guy didn't make a move. I mean, if, if one swat from the guy that big would knock somebody with loop, but not right, is it scary? Right. <laughs> he would take on. He'd take on anybody. He, he, one time he got his ass beat and he turned around and I told him, I said, man, I can't believe you got your ass beat. He said, Alan, it wasn't the first time and it ain't going to be the last. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, that was just the way he was. He was, he was a true street fighting man. And, uh, uh, you know, for him to perform barefooted, yeah, that was kind of unusual. That really represented the South there, and uh, um, he just uh, he he knew exactly what to do to rile that audience up, you know. And uh, they'd get standing ovations almost everywhere they went. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they didn't, there was something wrong with the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I don't ever remember them not getting a standing ovation. 
I can uh, imagine. Except in the bars, in the bars they did when they were before the hit record, you know. But uh, then I had the group, the Outlaws, you know, they were they a powerhouse. In fact, I, mm -hmm. I still work with the Outlaws today. Uh, Henry Paul and I are uh, very close friends, and uh, Henry, uh, I felt like, was done wrong in the Outlaws. They fired him just as the band broke big. I mean, they had uh, two hit albums, and they wanted to go more rock and roll and less country. Mm -hmm. So they fired Henry, and man, it, it uh, you could tell it broke his heart, you know, and, and uh, but I stuck with Henry through the uh, Henry Paul band. Uh, I, I still supported him and, and treated him as if he was just as big as he was when he was in now. Uh, and uh, of course, now he's the leader in the last uh, living uh, outlaw, you know. Monty Yoho is still alive, but he's not on the road anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you can imagine having the outlaws in Canada, I had the two guitar armies. You know, each one of them had three guitars. And, and you know, when I first suggested the three guitars, Ronnie told me, says, oh, man, they'll be stepping all over each other. And it, it just it just will not work. I said, you won't know until you try it. Mm -hmm. and of course, they tried it, and it clicked. It worked perfect, you know. They, they uh, came out with the, the Legion of Guitars, the Army, Guitar Army from Florida, and the Outlaws came out, and they had three guitars. And so we, we, uh, we made a lot of noise with that. And <laughs> having, the two, having the two of them on tour together was mm -hmm. fun time. I'm talking about hell raising and, and uh, playing the the uh, Beacon in uh, New York, and uh, we we just they they stuck together like a family, you know. And yeah. uh, uh, Henry Paul is still one of the nicest guys, and or he's he was probably the toughest of them all because he's big and uh, had some big fists, <laughs> and uh, but uh, he. Uh, he was always the nice one, you know, he always uh, uh, helping me in different ways. And uh, uh, even after uh, I had left, uh, Henry used to still call me on Sunday afternoon sometimes and just shoot the bull with me for a couple hours, you know. And uh, uh, he, he is now, I think, 74 years old and he's got him four or five kids, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, he, uh, he's, he leads the band very well, uh, and he's loyal. That's the main thing. He's a very loyal person. Well, another thing that I really like and respect about you is how you kept your business around Georgia and Florida at a time when the whole business was New York and L.A., how did you know to keep everything around Georgia? How did I get what? Well, how did you know that Georgia would be an okay place to do business as a record company and manager? Well, it just it, it just kind of happened that way. I mean, both Phil and I were, uh, and and uh, uh, my whole family was raised in Georgia, and. Mm -hmm. uh, um, one time, you know, we, we were offered uh, offices in New York and a guy offered to buy James Brown's house in New York to give to Otis if he'd move north. He asked me what I thought. And I said, I think you ought to stay with uh, the people who helped you get started. And I said, I think you ought to stick with them since they're the ones that stuck with you when nobody else did. And uh, he stayed in the South and uh, he kept a dynamite image here. He wouldn't, uh, 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 Otis and I never ate in a white restaurant in Macon, Georgia. We never did. He said, I don't want anybody to be calling me a uppity black man, you know? Yeah. And uh, uh, we go to black restaurants now together, you know, but uh, 
he uh, he was very conscious of wanting his uh, hometown people to love him. And we had a <clears throat> yearly uh, annual uh, homecoming show for Otis. And uh, it would sell out, boom, minutes the tickets would go on. And we'd have people standing outside still trying to get in. And they'd, they were crawling through the air conditioner ducts and things <laughs> like that, where if somebody turned the air conditioner on, it would have jumped them up. They were climbing high power uh, electrical poles to get to get to the balcony and jump off. And uh, it was it was like a war for us to keep people from <laughs> sneaking in. You know, they uh, we had to, in those days you had to keep all the doors unlocked because of the fire law. You know, the case of fire did break out, you didn't want to have them all padlocked up. And uh, so we had to hire a policeman to watch that door. But then we had to hire a guy to watch the policeman because uh, uh, he would let people in. And then I hired another guy <laughs> that walked around and checked on the guy watching the policeman. <laughs> but uh, uh, we ran successful shows. I mean, it was, it was, we, you know, people didn't care about the black artists as much until we got into business. When I say care, oh, they loved them as, as fans and things like that, but they, uh, uh, they didn't go out of their way to make a, a Negro feel uh, as important as a white person, you know? And uh, we did. I mean, we treated all of our artists with mutual respect. Once that word got around, more Black musicians flooded to us rather than going to New York, you know, because prior to us, you know, people figure if they went to New York, New Yorkers would understand the black man and, and uh, the Southerners would be too busy trying to cause some trouble, you know. But uh, we ended up taking them all later. I ended up with the uh, 55 African-American entertainers at one time, and that was bigger than uh, Barry Gordy's Motown management. And the difference between his and mine was he only let his acts go out on the uh, Motown reviews and do the package show. Well, my acts worked seven days a week if it was up to me. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the more they work, the better they get. Mm -hmm. And the uh, uh, less trouble do they get into if they're busy working. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, you know, we had, we had quite a family. A couple of them didn't get along real well, but uh, the majority of them all got along extremely well, you know. And uh, you don't get a better person than Percy Sledge and Otis Redding. I mean, Otis Redding became my best friend in life. And uh, when he moved around to Georgia, I moved around to Georgia next door to him, which I was still a mile away from his house, but... Uh, I was his next door neighbor. I taught Otis how to hunt and fish and ride horses. And he taught me how to write songs and uh, how to structure songs. And uh, it was just fun time. I mean, Otis uh, laughed the majority of the time. You know, he uh, he had a couple of times that he, he got, uh, I caught him crying and, and, uh, I was his good listening ear for the things like that. He brought his personal problems to me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we worked very well together. You know, I would have been on that plane, but I had uh, what they call block sinuses. And uh, I was flying with him from uh, Muscle Shoals, Alabama, down to Jekyll Island. <clears throat> and, uh, when we'd been flying at something like 12 or 13,000 feet, we flew through a tornado to start with. That was a lot of fun. I mean, if all planes are falling 400 feet at a time, oh. and it sound like a shotgun when it hit the bottom of the air pocket. But uh, we made it all the way down to Jekyll, but when we started going down, 
my sinus is blocked. And it's like somebody driving a nail right in the forehead, boy. And uh, I had stood up and was about to kick the window out on the airplane because I thought I would suffocate. And uh, the pilot saw it and he immediately took me back up uh, to, to, to the, the, where we'd been flying, the heights we'd been flying. And uh, then he took two hours to bring me down real slow, a little bit at a time. But it grounded me from flying. And uh, because of that, I wasn't on that plane when he flew to Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, uh, just different things happened, uh, you know, that uh, were miracles to me. I mean, I, I, I lived a charmed life. Uh, and still God, are yeah. living a charmed life, and hence this excellent book that we've been blessed with. Yeah, well, I tell you, I, I, uh, uh, I was just a blessed human being that uh, I didn't have any more trouble than what I did. And uh, I'm, <laughs> Sam and Dave uh, were a little different from Otis. Uh, we went to a freedom rally in Philadelphia and Dr. King and uh, Rap Brown and, and uh, a lot of your heavyweights were speaking that day. Well, there was only three white people there, and one of them was a, a dark-skinned Jewish guy, so he was could pass for a mulatto. Well, uh, man, uh, uh, Sam and Dave went off and left me. I went to get in the limousine to leave, and they had already left. And when I went to go back inside the auditorium, the stage door man had already locked the stage door, so I was stuck on the outside of the building. And uh, this angry crowd is beating up everybody white in the vicinity. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, uh, I was scared to death. I mean, I walking through that crowd, I prayed to God, please let it be a gun. Don't let nobody stab me, please, you know. And I'm walking through that crowd and I'm praying. I really thought I was going to die. And uh, uh, all of a sudden I heard a voice call out, Alan, and way away. And I was like, damn, is that you, God? I mean, <laughs> are you calling me God? And uh, I, uh, I'm going to get you out of here. And I recognized it then as Sam and Dave's old road manager. He, he was in his late 50s, early 60s. And uh, he had gotten out of the uh, limousine uh, from Sam and Dave on the damn freeway and <laughs> waved down a cab and came back to the place to find me. And uh, he did find me and did get me out of there. But, but when when he hollered out, uh, Bo had a gold tooth. Mm -hmm. It's a star. And uh, when I was looking for where the voice was coming, the moonlight was shining down. And it was hitting that gold tooth. And I could see that gold tooth beaming up my way. I, Bo, is that you? It's me, Alan. I'm going to get you out of here. And uh, he did. He got me out of there. And I was... We, uh, I even had my first suite in a hotel at the Ben Franklin Hotel in Philadelphia, and I couldn't go to sleep at all. I ended up going across the street and playing a pinball machine all night uh, and uh, couldn't stop winning games. I think I left it with 180 greens this morning or something. But I came home and I resigned uh, from the company. Uh, that was the scaredest I'd ever been. And uh, the fact was that uh, Sam and Dave liked to play jokes on you, you know. Uh, another time they hung me out of a seventh story window of a hotel by my ankles. And I'm thinking, man, my shoes going to come off of my yeah. socks pull off. And I'm, I'm going to splatter all over that pavement down there. And uh, 
uh, needless to say, I was scared, scared, scared. And uh, he got me back in. Well, that's another time I resigned. <laughs> I said, to hell with it. I'm not, going, I'm not going back out on the road with these guys. They're crazy. <laughs> and uh, they all know. thought it was funny as I would get out, you know. And it wasn't funny at all when you're hanging out the window, you know. So anyway, we ended our relationship with Sam and Dave and um, Otis had been killed. So the spirit of soul music kind of left our stable. We started going towards rock and roll. Phil found uh, Dwayne All and I found Bias Skaggs. And we had two pretty good ones to start off with. And uh, uh, when I left the company, uh, my brother and I had begun having some difficulties getting along. And uh, I left the company. I went out and auditioned 187 bands. Now, that's a lot of music, boy. I yes. mean, if you imagine each one of those bands playing a set. Ooh. And uh, I went all the way back to band number 13. And that band number 13. Leonard just Skinner. To be Leonard Skinner. Yes. <laughs> I changed my lucky number from five to 13. Every time I saw 13 all in a contract, that was the one I signed. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, uh, your, your book is just full of great, great, great stories like that. I, I can only urge everyone to read this book and not only be entertained but get a sense for some history that wasn't fully documented or was inaccurately documented. So thank you, Alan, for what you do. And thank you for what you did. Well, thank you so much for the kind words. Uh, uh, I, uh, I loved what I was doing. Uh, it, uh, you know, after, after the Leonard Skinner, the, the outlaws came my way and, at one time, I had the Outlaws and Skinner together. And I said, man, I got the five hottest guitar players in the world. I mean, mm -hmm. they are they are smoking, you know. And, of course, uh, uh, I had a separation with Leonard Skinner, and, and uh, I stayed with the Outlaws. Like I said, I still work with the Outlaws today as far as uh, public relations and, and trying to uh, keep the name out there, promotion. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, I thank you for those words. They, they, they touched my heart. They are meant. And I thank you for your time. And I look forward to whatever is to come from you in the future. But really, thank you again for your time, Alan. Well, thank you. Outrocast.